The history of Britain has often been shaped by war. Our ancestors fought to defend their land, their cultures and their beliefs, sometimes against invaders like the Normans and the Romans, constantly getting driven back here, and other times against their fellow countrymen. Forget your chivalry. This is life or death. And I'm curious to learn more about the key battles in British history to discover how they've influenced our past and our present. From the massacre of a Celtic warrior queen and her army. They're coming for you, and they're covered in steel. To the Scottish king who defied the odds in a fight for independence. A poorly armed band of men going up against the might of Christendom. So I'll be meeting historians, archaeologists, weapons experts, and enthusiasts who continue to live and breathe the stories. To find out how six critical battles change the path of this country. I'm in the West Midlands, about 20 miles east of Birmingham, on my way to the site of one of the bloodiest battles that ever occurred on English soil. It took place nearly 2,000 years ago. The might of the Roman army and our ancestors, the Celts, led by the warrior queen, Boudicca, who, you might say, was our first national hero. Their bloody clash came to be known as the Battle of Watling Street. It took place right in the centre of England, around the year 61 AD. Our ancestors, the ancient Britons, were Celts, an Iron Age culture that had thrived for centuries throughout much of Europe. But in 43 AD, they were conquered by the Emperor Claudius, who arrived on British shores to extend the reach of the Roman Empire. Iron Age Britain would have been very strange for the Romans. It is over the water. They've come to the area that we call the English Channel and the Southern North Sea. It is a challenge for them to cross that water. I don't think that they were intimidated by Iron Age Britain or the tribes of ancient Britain. They would have known what to expect and they probably looked down on them. A previous Roman emperor, Julius Caesar, had already made two attempts to invade Britain around a century earlier. But there was no long-term occupation. Instead, the Celtic tribes started trading with the Romans. When Claudius brought his invasion force in 43 AD, they spent five years claiming territory and control from tribes, including the Iceni and Trinovantes who lived in the areas we now know as Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk. To find out more about our Celtic ancestors and their lifestyle, I'm meeting Richard Knox, a specialist in their way of life and traditions before the Roman conquest. How harmonious would life have been for Celtic tribes then, having made a deal with the Romans? It, it, could, have been, it could have been pretty good. I mean, we know archaeologically, we know that since Julius Caesar first came to these shores, people were, you know, Britons were, were buying Roman goods, so Roman pottery, Roman wine and all this sort of thing. You are preserving a bit of your culture, hopefully. You are preserving a bit of your own power, hopefully. You have to remember that under the Romans, it was a military dictatorship. The army ran everything. The army built everything, all the roads, the forts, the bridges, the aqueducts, and the governor was in charge of that army in, in the province and all the taxes would have been collected by people associated with the army and all this sort of thing. So you really were living in a pretty terrifying state. And financially, the Celtic tribes would be paying taxes to the Romans, were they? Yes. I mean, they'd have had of their own taxation system because they've got a chieftain at the top and everybody would, um, you know, pay tribute to their own chieftain. But then the chieftain is in turn now paying tribute to Rome as well. The Roman map of Britain looks very different from the way we know it today. Having invaded the lands of the various Celtic communities, the Romans built their own garrison towns, linked by their famously straight paved roads. The Iceni tribe of East Anglia was soon overrun. Their ruler was Prositagus, with his wife, Boudicca, at his side. Tell me about the Iceni tribe, then. Prasutagus was the king there, and uh, he put up very little resistance to the Romans. 
and um, seems to have, uh, have made this, this deal that he would become a client king to Rome. Um, the problem started when he died in AD 60. Um, he did a will. In half of his will, he leaves his lands to the Emperor Nero. And uh, to the other half, he actually leaves to his daughters. But in, because they're too young, he leaves the kingdom in the care of his wife, Boudicca. Presumably, the empire was expecting to get all of his kingdom when he died, possibly because his heirs were women. The Romans did tend to have a fairly dim view of, of politically active women, particularly what they would see as, uh, as barbarian women on the edges of the empire. After the death of Prasutagus, then, the Romans didn't agree with what he'd set out in his will. What was their reaction? The house is ransacked, Boudicca is publicly whipped and her daughters are raped by, by the soldiers, um, which obviously is a very, very harsh reaction. We actually know very little about Boudicca. What we do know comes from the Roman writer Cassius Dio, who describes her as, in appearance, most terrifying in the glance of her eye, most fierce. And her voice was harsh. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips. Around her neck was a large golden necklace. Well, the fierce, flaxen-haired Celtic queen was about to become the scourge of the Roman army. From a modern perspective, I think we probably see Boudicca as almost this national hero. But really, this, it stemmed from what was a very personally driven anger and a personal vendetta mm. against the Romans. So how, how did this come from something that was some, so personal into this much larger revolt? I'd say exactly that. Yeah, it starts off that she has been affronted and she's supporting her daughters who have been, you know, raped. Uh, and her husband, whose will has been ignored by Rome. As it gathers momentum and she realises that more of her kinfolk are, are in a similar sort of feeling. Yeah, you know, well, you know, these, these Romans have done bad things to you. Join me, join me, and we can try and kick them out. That was seen differently in Celtic culture then, was it, the role of, of, the, of women? What we know of classical writers writing about the Celtic peoples, they did seem to have equal reverence for men and women in power. Driven by her public humiliation at the hands of the Romans, a fiery Boudicca persuaded neighbouring tribes to join her uprising and take on the might of Rome. After her abusive treatment at the hands of the Romans, Queen Boudicca was determined to strike fear at the very heart of their occupation. She marched her rebel army on Camulodunum, a city we know today as Colchester. When the Romans first occupied Britain in 43 AD, they made Camulodunum their capital city. They named it after the ancient Britain's god of war, Camulos, and rebuilt the town in their own image of civilization. There were theatres, baths, and a temple dedicated to the Roman emperor Claudius, who masterminded and led their invasion. Here at Colchester, in the foundations of this very building that we're in now, Colchester Castle, was the center of the Roman imperial cult for the province, the Temple of Claudius, uh, a very potent symbol of Roman power because it is in stamping the footprint of Rome on the previous capital of the Iron Age world in Britain. By the start of Boudicca's campaign in around 60 AD, Camulodunum had become a home for retired Roman soldiers. It had few defences and was an easy target for Boudicca's vengeful warriors. As night fell, thousands of bloodthirsty Celts poured into the town, slaughtering, butchering and burning everything in their path. Celtic warriors had a fearsome reputation and they were known for uncontrolled aggression. I've come to meet expert weapons maker Magnus Sigurdsson Hadrada to find out about their weaponry and fighting style. They would collect the head of their enemies if it was worth collecting. If he was a good warrior, 
they would collect your head and preserve it. They were honouring you. And they'd actually pickle it in sort of cedar oil or something like that and stick it in the house on a shelf. And they are remembering you as a great warrior, but still remembering they beat you. <laughs> it's a warrior culture, and these guys want to be seen to be engaged in an individual combat. So they are recognised as heroes. The Celts' passion for warrior culture can also be seen in the way they created their swords. They were made of piled steel, which is an early form of pattern welding, where they'd have actually stacked several different types of iron and steel together in a big block and then beaten that out to an edge. So you could be looking at sort of four or five days' work to make a blade. Mm. Then you've got to finish it, polish it, put the handle on. Remember, because these aren't made to a pattern, you could be looking at a month's work. How well balanced is this going to be when we've got the handle and the furniture at the end of it there as a, as a Celtic warrior's sword? Badly balanced, because the longsword has an organic handle and it's got no real mass to it. In contrast, the Roman soldier's sword, the Gladius, was precision engineered to kill quickly. It's just designed for stabbing. Mm. And this is a moderate sort of period blade. It's at the same period as the um, Boudicca Uprising. Yeah. It's a Fulham Gladius. But the balance is a lot better. Do you want to...? Uh... Yeah, let's have a feel on that. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I can, I, I can feel I've got, I've got weight behind my hand there. Wait, that's, that's the pommel there, yeah. is it? Yeah, that's so the, I can feel That's got... the counterbalance. And because the blade's shorter, even with a lighter pommel, it, it will balance that, and it is very good at thrusting. With his replica Celtic sword now finished, Magnus is keen to show me the effect it could have had on a Roman soldier. The whole object is big, long slashes. That puts an opponent down quickly and easily. The thing about the slashes, you need, you need quite a bit of space around you, yeah, don't you, but... as, a, as opposed to the, the Romans, who could do short stabs, and they could do that in their great big wall, their great big warrior wall. But, but these are individuals. They're fighting as individuals, and they want to move around, dance around, make the most of a space and then strike out when the timing's right for that one shot. Oh, whoa! Oh, I did not expect that at all. I thought it would come just glancing off. Man, she That's sliced stopped. right into that. That's stopped when it's hit the leg bone. So when I said the slash will put you down, that's your arm off. But if you hit a bit harder, that's your leg. I'm off. absolutely no. shocked by that. Okay. No, no, no. Oh! Again, that crunching noise is where you hit the bone. That's bone. Yeah. And I can't be able to put any effort into that. No. To cause that great big slash through there. Look at that. That's what we've just opened up, and I've gone right down to the bone because I could hear it. You hear that clack? Yeah. I'm amazed at the damage that this can do. And it looks like a butter knife. It kind of uh, does. A big butter it looks knife. Looks like a, a kind of, yeah, a giant butter knife. Next up, the Roman gladius. It's mainly a stabby weapon, um, used in short, confined spaces. So you just. And this twist. is in, that, in the Roman wall. Yep. Defensive wall. Yep. And as you push forward, twist it so that the blade goes flat. So actually, if you actually hit the upper torso, and that slides between the ribs. Moving forward. Oh. See, I didn't need to do much effort there at all, did I? And that is a nasty, nasty stab wound. In 2014, almost 2,000 years after Boudicca sacked Colchester, archaeologists uncovered a hall of Roman jewellery which gives us an idea of what might have happened on that fateful night. This group of jewellery clearly had great meaning. It was buried very hastily, maybe within days, but maybe even within hours before Boudicca rampaged and sacked the town. So we have this military armillae here, this band of metal, which would have been um, a, a Roman military award. We have a a little amulet known as a bulla, and we also have uh, an intaglio. This would have been uh, an inlay for a finger ring that depicts a panther. 
perhaps one of the most stunning pieces in the Fenwick Hoard is, a, a, well, it's a pair of bracelets, actually. This lovely gold metalwork interweaving. And um, this is very similar to Roman gold jewellery that was being worn at a very similar time in, in Italy. And in fact, we have examples of just this type from Pompeii, um, another town, if you like, um, that is a time capsule buried by the eruption of Vesuvius, much like Roman Colchester has been destroyed, if you like, and, and a time capsule due to the Boudican revolt. We believe, the, the nature of looking at how this was excavated, we believe that these two individuals wanted to come back uh, to collect this jewellery. It obviously meant a huge amount to them. And the assumption of the two individuals here who are living in Roman Colchester, Camelodunum, that they would return. There's absolutely no understanding of, of what's about to happen, that the town, as they know it, uh, where they live, their home, is going to be completely destroyed. Those who survived the initial attack fled to the Temple of Claudius and barricaded themselves inside. At first, they were safe from Boudicca's bloodthirsty army. But after two days, the Celts broke in. The Temple of Claudius uh, would have been an absolute beacon to Boudicca. She would have aimed straight for it because it was um, not only a magnificent building, it was a representation of Rome, but it also housed um, the, the, the imperial cult, so the, the religious worship of, of what was Rome. We have very little sort of um, literary sources and, and, and history around the, the destruction of Colchester and the Boudican Rebellion. We have one Roman source, um, Tacitus, and what's interesting is he names uh, the Temple of Claudius and he actually tells us a little bit about the story of the destruction of Colchester and the fact that um, the, the, the townspeople, or at least maybe a couple of hundred people who were left, tried to survive the onslaught um, here in the temple above our heads. And it took two days before the Iron Age Brits and Boudicca eventually broke in and, and slaughtered the, the last remaining Roman citizens of the town. So above our heads uh, would have been absolute bloodshed. Buoyed by her victory, Boudicca and the Celtic army continued their bloody war of retribution and marched on to Londinium, London. Once again, the inhabitants were slaughtered and the city was set ablaze. It's written that in total, Boudicca's death trail amounted to 70,000 Romans. If the Romans had lost Britain, other countries in the Roman Empire would have seen this as a sign of weakness. So it was essential they reacted with force. Their governor in Britain was Suetonius Paulinus. Along with 10,000 soldiers, he was hundreds of miles away in Mona, now Anglesey, conquering the Druids. Rome is worried about the Druids because they seem to be a religious, political, cultural force that is very widely networked, has been a thorn in Roman side for a long time, and the Druids seem to be able to motivate people to act. On receiving news of the bloodshed in Camulodunum and Londinium, Paulinus and his men began the long march south along Watling Street to stop Boudicca's destructive uprising. The Romans could be, you know, really upset, you know, yes. genuinely shocked if a, if a client kingdom rebelled against them. But, you know, we've given them everything, you know, we've, we've been so kind to them, how could they possibly throw this back in our this, faces? This disbelief from the Romans that they were, they were having all their generosity thrown back at them. Absolutely, yeah. Because the Romans think that they have got the best thing to offer, you know, they're part of civilization. so why would anyone throw that back in their faces? As her campaign went on then, her, her reputation and that sense of power must have have, must have really built. We, we don't know how she managed to, 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 you know, spread the word. And, you know, obviously her own people are going to have been very supportive of her because they'll have seen what happened to the will of their former king. And obviously they've, they've witnessed her being uh, whipped and will know about the daughters being raped. So they will be with her. It does change hugely from, you know, one woman and her tribe being affronted 
to a, a very, very large revolt involving, you know, a vast army of, of angry Britons who certainly, if you read Tacitus and particularly Cassius Dio, the things that they're alleged to have done, some of which they certainly will have done, are, are you know, really horrendous, really, really barbaric things. Nearly 2,000 years since Boudicca's rebellion, we still don't know exactly where her armies confronted the Romans. What we do know, though, is that it's called the Battle of Watling Street, named after the old Roman road, which is now the A5. The Roman writer Tacitus tells us that after destroying Colchester and London, Boudicca headed north to Verulamium now St Albans in Hertfordshire. Once again, her Celtic warriors laid waste to the town. Realising the threat that Boudicca presented, Roman governor Suetonius Paulinus had no choice but to crush her rebellion. Tacitus wrote that Paulinus chose a battle site with a valley known as a defile. What Tacitus didn't tell us is where that was. But one location that seems to fit the description is Mansetta in Warwickshire. I'm on my way to meet Edward Smallwood, a former policeman with an interest in Roman military techniques. He thinks Paulinus may have chosen Mansetta as the location of the battle because of its topography. We're on the edge of, or the top, of what's known as Hearts Hill Ridge. Uh, and this is ancient ridgeland that's hardly changed in thousands of years. Wow, OK. We're standing at about 95 metres above sea level, and in front of us, the hill drops away to a plain that's about 84 metres above sea level. Yeah, OK. So there's a good height gain here, and from here, you've got a fantastic military advantage. And we've got to remember that the Romans are professional military fighters. You're talking about a Roman legion comprising 5,000-plus you can't be a legionnaire unless you're a Roman citizen. You've got to be five foot seven, anything between 17 and 40. You sign up for 25 years. They're not married. If they're married, the marriage is annulled. So you've not got to worry about any relatives. You're fighting to the death. How important was the Romans' military might with respect to their vast expanse of the empire? Well, in effect, they are a killing machine. They're a fighting machine. They fight as one, even though there's thousands of legionnaires who are Roman citizens. They've got people who are working and fighting with them called auxiliaries. And then you've got cavalry, so they march as one block. They're professionals compared to the British tribes who are amateurs. You're talking of a man wearing metal with weapons, uh, helmets, fighting against people sometimes who fought naked or with skins and small shields. After hearing news of Boudicca's attack on London, Paulinus realised he was vastly outnumbered and pulled back up Watling Street. He sought out a location that would play to his strengths and planned to lure Boudicca into an ambush. Edward is confident that Mansetta could be that place. Paulinus hurtled south to go down to London, but as he approaches, when he gets to London, he realises that the army that's coming towards London, Boudicca's army, is so outnumbering that he would stand no chance. He took the decision to make a tactical retreat away from London, and the argument that we're putting forward here as a candidate site is that he came this way because he knows this way. He's travelled this way down from Anglesey, so he knows the way back up. Well, Linus and the Roman army have this height advantage, this altitude advantage, that they are going to be fighting downhill. Normally, they're fighting... You would fight at about a metre a man, but in this, they're really closed in. There's okay. not a gap between them. OK. I mean, there is a bit of debate and yeah. speculation over the exact location. They've all put forward very good reasons about location and a distance, but there's no problem in Paulinus coming back to here because he could do 250 miles in 13 or 14 days easily. Another local resident supports Edward's theory that Mansetta is the battlefield site. Margaret Hughes has made a detailed study of the history. Why do you think this is where Boudicca fought that last battle? Tacitus' description of the battle is very, very short. So you haven't got a lot to go on, but he describes the battle site as in a place with a defile, with woods behind and an open plain in front. 
But when you begin to look at all the different translations of defile, they are many and varied, and that goes back over centuries. Using her knowledge of Latin, Margaret has analysed the word defile used by Tacitus. She believes it's actually plural, so Tacitus would have meant several defiles. To my absolute delight and astonishment, and I can remember going, oh my goodness me, when I found it, there is just such a shape in this area, in the Hartsill Ridge. Tacitus says in three words, like a wedge shape, the legionaries erupted. And what I'm putting forward is the idea that it was an ambush within a battle because Paulinus concealed maybe two thirds of the legionaries, leaving enough out for the British to see them mm. and to think, oh, come on, lads, we're okay here. It's just that little group. We can deal with this lot. We can take that. Yeah. And then, at the right moment, erupt. But there's another candidate for the battle site, also close to Watling Street, but further south at Church Stowe. So we're on the move again. John Pegg, a landscape archaeologist, believes the Church Stowe site supports the ambushing theory. He believes he has physical evidence to back his view. So it's, it's kind of a massive defensive complex that's here for some reason. Um, almost certainly medieval parts. There's reference to it being Anglo-Saxon as well. I think there's a significant Roman component, but I think it's all based on some much deeper ditches that were Iron Age in origin. The other interesting point to note about this one is there's another fort, exactly the same footprint, just to the south across a small defile. But when one looks down the valley, there's a kink in it. This is effectively on a side valley to the main valley. So the Iceni would have approached down the main valley, and only when they got into the killing zone would they have looked to their left and seen another two forts up a small ravine. And this is one of them. So this is a position that's set well back. So you've got your final surprise. But I don't think it ever came to that. I think the, uh, the main action took, took place down slope with this as a target. And then from here, the troops that were stationed moved out and down. Would this have been the main kind of garrison, the main fortress I, for I, the Romans? If the, if the Romans had 10,000 troops stationed close to the battlefield, they'll have needed several forts of this scale. To have a camp to be occupied by 10,000 troops would be massive and flat. But to occupy a ridge, you could do it in half a dozen much smaller defensible forts, and that way you've got a way of collapsing your defensive perimeter. So if one fort falls, it's not over. You've got another one to fall back on. This, I think, has the potential to be the, the Alamo of the day. The argument would run, then, that there would be more fortresses, if not as significant as this, but, but similar, uh, around the ridge. If you've got 10,000 troops in a marching camp waiting for an inevitable onslaught, you keep them busy. You have them build their own defences over the course of a week, two weeks, whatever it takes. And this one just might have an enormous significance to the history of Britain under that Roman occupation. I think it does, with or without Boudicca. Someone had a reason to, to build this. John also believes the Battle of Watling Street took place in a field next to the fort. The field's unique landscape would have drawn Paulinus here to fight Boudicca and her Celtic warriors. You're quite convinced this is, this is the site then of the, of the battle? This is head and shoulders above the rest in terms of strategic location, in terms of the topography, and both in, and in terms of the artefacts that we're finding, earthworks and physical material that might come from a battle. So we think that the, the Romans then would have been, what, based up here on the higher ground? We've got 10,000 men, including the infantry and the cavalry, and uh, Tacitus is clear, Paulinus lines his men up in three units. The infantry in the centre, the heavy legions, the 14th and the 20th, and he has the auxiliaries on the wings. Well, this, this is a valley through here, isn't it? 
it's absolutely value, and that, that's the key characteristic you've really got to look at when you're interpreting Tacitus. Regardless of which side Paulinus chose, he faced insurmountable odds as Boudicca approached with her warriors and a massive following of Celtic spectators keen to witness her victory. We have up to 230,000 native Britons, which is an astonishingly high number, against what is allegedly 10,000 Romans. So this, they're, they're fearful odds. On paper, it seems pretty obvious which way you'd bet anyway, which way you think the battle was going to turn out. Paulinus knows that even though his opponent's got, let's say there are 200,000 native Britons, let's say within that there are 100,000 warriors, let's say within that there are probably only 10,000 warriors who are troops anywhere near as good as his auxiliaries, let alone anything else, he knows they'll be funneled towards him in a very, very dense mass. But what kind of army were the Celts about to face? This is very much what uh, a Roman foot soldier would have worn. Yeah, a legionary soldier in the first century of Rome. So starting at the top, I've got this heavy metal helmet, very cleverly designed because the piece at the front will stop any blows taking the face off. Yeah, yeah. The piece at the back will protect the neck. Yes, that's these, right cheek, down. these cheek pieces, which will be fastened underneath, will offer full protection almost to the top of the head. Incredibly heavy. Yeah. Uh, yeah let's feel how heavy that is. Oh yeah. And then you've got all this armour on as well. Yeah, you? this is uh, Lorica segmentata. Really clever. Believe it or not, it's ever so comfortable. The worst bit is getting it on and off. Uh -huh. But it's protected, it flexes, it moves, it protects the shoulders. These are all individual plates, are they? All yeah. individual plates. In front of me, I've obviously got the shield, which yes. I made mention about. Uh, rounded, pieces of wood laid at different angles, a bit like a modern-day plywood, with a metal edge and this great big heavy boss. It was the Romans' offensive weaponry that earned them a fearsome reputation throughout the battlefields of the world. How would they have begun such an attack or, or, or such a, such well, a fight? Each, each Roman legionary soldier would have two of these. And this is called a? Pelum, a fantastic piece of engineering because it's got about two metres in length. That's a hardened tip. And if you look at the size of that, it then goes in and it's narrower all the way down to the base. So once that has penetrated something, there's no friction to slow this down as it travels through. It's lighter than I thought it would be, but yeah, that's, oh, that's really nicely balanced. So you throw that, what, like, like, you Just like, like a, a, a javelin. javelin. Yeah, OK. At last, the moment came for Boudicca to exact her revenge for the Romans' defiling of her daughters and their oppression of the Celtic tribes. With a great war cry, she unleashed her horde of Celtic warriors against the Roman line. And at about 100 yards, as the native Britons approach, the first pillar is unleashed. So a flight of 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 javelins comes over, doosh, straight into the British ranks. So now the main shock weapon is the heavy pillar with a really heavy lead weight behind the shaft. That's fired at point blank range. And that brings the front rank, two rank, three ranks of native Britons down Crashing in a mass. Down. And suddenly the advance starts to halt and suddenly it loses formation. So the Romans barely need to actually make contact because they've got the high ground. So that's extending the range of all their weapons. It's, it's as unfair a fight as you can possibly get well, in this terrain. And now we've come down here, I, I can really appreciate that advantage because you would feel surrounded. Absolutely. Well, the psychology is even worse because you've got the surrounding terrain, but you've got 200,000 people behind you. Boudicca's warriors were about to face their biggest problem of all, poised right in front of them. It was now time for Paulinus's men to show why they were the most feared army in the world. Then the Romans get the order to form their wedge formations, their Coena swinehead wedge formations. Their gladius is drawn, the shield scutum is set, and they start stamping forward and stamping forward and stamping forward. And once they're in reach of the Britons, they stab and they stab and they stab. And soon the wedge formations drive the native Britons into such a dense mass, they can't fight at all, and they are butchered where they stand. Paulinus wasn't a nice man, and they're coming for you and they're covered in steel. You're there, you've got woad and a stick. What are you gonna do? As the Romans started to decimate the Celts' front line, Boudicca's warriors were pushed back into a dense mass, unable to fight. And I'm thrusting, so I'm 
forward, thrust, forward, thrust. With the shield and stab, shield, stab. So I'm constantly getting driven back, back here. Forward, thrust, forward, thrust. And if you imagine there's a thousand of us all doing this, it's like a spiked thrust coming towards you. As the battle raged on, thousands of Celts pushed forwards up the hill towards the Romans, unaware of the danger waiting for them. The topography of the landscape was now playing into Paulinus's hands. If you were an Iceni warrior or you know, fighter, soldier, whatever you want to call it, making your way up here, and you weren't as part of that front line, and probably an enthusiastic, roaring, noisy front line, if you're coming in after that, you've seen the slaughter that's in front of you, oh, oh, is it, whether you want to or not, you're being you're pushed forward. towards this, this it's a killing certain machine. death. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a wall with swords coming out of it, spears flying over it. There's nothing you can do. Complete terror down here for the Iceni in this, so. in this plane, in this it? bowl. Just over the ridge, you can mass up a formation of troops in these wedge formations and just start a slow, controlled advance down this low angle slope, impact with the enemy, and then your wedge formation forces the enemy into these triangular bits where they can be attacked from both sides and you slowly, disciplined, move forward. The Romans are, this is their Alamo. They know they're gonna almost certainly die. They're gonna give a good account of themselves, but they're gonna show no mercy. So suddenly you're looking in this bowl and you're looking at a 360 degree panorama of Roman troops and no way out. So you turn and you face your only escape from the valley, back the way you've come. But that's blocked by 200,000 other people, family, friends, warriors, civilians, and you've got to get through that 300 meter wide gap there. The Roman cavalry's got the ridges on both sides, the Roman archers are piling in, and you've got to get through ranks of wagons. People have come here with wagons. They've not come here on foot. They're expecting to grandstand this. They're expecting to sit and watch the final victory. Everybody's thinking of plunder and getting to the Roman camp, thinking that it's going to be over in two minutes. Well, I do think it's a short battle, but it's the other way. Because once the Romans become this military killing machine, things are over very quickly. The battle is over very quickly, probably one hour, two hours. What takes much longer the rest of the day is the pursuit, the butchering, the killing, the slaughtering of the native Britons as they flee. You can imagine across these fields, the lines there falter, it goes through all the lines, etc., rank after rank after rank. People are dying at the front, pillar is still coming over, slingshots, ballista bolts, people start fleeing from the back. They hit the wall of camp followers who are about 130,000 of them who are there to watch their victory and they're stopped and suddenly the Romans are stabbing everybody in the back and that could go on the entire day. It was an absolutely brutal slaughter. Surely there's a point where the Romans say, right, en enough, we've, we've killed enough here, we've made our point, we've, we've won this battle. You would think that was the case, but that's not how the Romans operate. When the Romans fight, conflicts, battles, they fight for absolute total victory. And they also know here they're fighting for their survival. They know that if Boudicca had won, the province would have fallen. And this is their one chance to get rid of their opponents so they can start rebuilding the province, which is, by the way, exactly what they do. The Romans continued to slaughter the men, women, children, and even the pack animals for the rest of the day. Realizing the fight was lost, Boudicca vanished into history. Do we know what happened to Boudicca at the battle or after the battle? Like all of these things, we don't know exactly what happened. All we can see it through is the prism of the primary sources, which are all writing from the Roman perspective. So some of them say that she poisoned herself, for example, but the truth is we don't know. She does disappear from history, and the rebellion is defeated and crushed, and the Roman province begins to flourish from that point onwards. So she meets a sad and ignominious end. We know all about Boudicca from the Roman sources, and she becomes a figure of interest in British history from that point all the way through to the present day. Taught at school to all school children, monumentalized in sculpture, in riding in a chariot, etc., all the way to this day. But it's worth reflecting that although she almost defeated the Romans in the province of Britannia, ultimately 
she failed and paid a very high price indeed. According to Tacitus, up to 80,000 Britons may have died in the battle that day, with only 400 Romans succumbing to the Celts. If indeed Boudicca did kill herself, would that have been deemed a, an honourable way for her to, to terminate her life? Everything we can discuss would be pure speculation. And of course, Tacitus writing that she poisoned herself may not actually even be the truth, because that's a very sort of Roman way of, of doing yourself in if you're, um, you know, if you're disgraced or if you've lost or whatever. That's the sort of thing a senator might do. Um, but uh, so it could be that he's put a Roman slant on her death, or it may be completely genuine. There are, obviously, the, 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 the Iron Age people knew plenty of ways of poisoning. She would have been in a desperate way because she had just caused the death of all the people who had just followed her. There's speculation and, and rumours that she didn't kill herself, and, well, there, there are many different stories as to what actually happened to her. There, there are all sorts of speculations, but and, and, and with the absence of a, of a definitive fact, you're always going to get people um, coming up with all sorts of ideas, and I know there are some very colourful legends um, around, certainly. One of the most outlandish stories is that Boudicca's body is buried under London's King's Cross station. Supposedly, it lies beneath platform 10 to this day. Boudicca's challenge, I think, was a massive wake-up call. It really rocked Rome. This was an important new province. It had been rocked to its foundations by the Boudican revolt, and the Romans got away with it you know, by the skin of their teeth. They were very fortunate, you know, probably because they chose the circumstances for that showdown battle, and it was in their favor. If things had been a bit different, well, the province could have been lost. The chances are, given how difficult the Romans had found it to conquer Britain to this point, they would never have come back. So there would have been no Roman Britain. There would have been no Britain that we know of today the way that we've developed since that time because the Romans would never have been here. That's quite a mind-blowing thought to think of it in those terms. So much, so many centuries of history, not, not exactly defined, but kind of that, 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 that's a catalyst. What happened here in this field was a catalyst for the way it went as opposed to the number of other ways it could have gone. That's quite hard to take in, I think, that. Nowadays, there's a, a very much romanticised view of, of Boudicca. Do we know how uh, and when that image of her came about? The texts of Cassius Dio and uh, Tacitus are going to have been written down probably in the medieval period and possibly again in the 16th and 17th century. So most of what survives of, of original Roman writings are transcripts which have been written down later on. Late Georgians and the Victorians are the people who you, you really romanticise everything. They bring things really to the fore into absolute, you know, the limelight, if you like, so it's full public gaze uh, on, on the, the daring exploits of our, of our ancestors. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the great bronze statues, your classic Victorian um, writer and sculptor is going to be bringing to the fore. Romanticising that, that story yeah. and making it... Yeah. But, I mean, there's no, no doubt it's an amazing and dramatic story from our past. It's said that the Roman Emperor, Nero, was so shaken up by Boudicca's rebellion and the death toll after the battle that he considered withdrawing from Britain altogether. But after the Battle of Watling Street, the Romans effectively established martial law in England and Wales. Garrison forts were erected, the length and breadth of the country as a show of strength and a reminder to the barbarians that the Romans were not to be challenged again. After more than 350 years, Rome eventually withdrew from this island. But the legacy they left behind, from central heating to Christianity, from written language to even the calendar we use to this day, dramatically changed and shaped the future of Britain. <laughs>